about your glory. We want to give you glory. Let my life look like your glory. Don't let them see me. But let them see your glory. Let them see your glory. Holy, holy. 
brief word of scripture. I'm going to be speaking from the subject of Jesus Christ, the gate. Jesus Christ, the gate. And when you look throughout the scriptures, there are several different revelations that even the Lord himself gives about the gate or the door or the way. One of the first places I want to read, and this is a very familiar passage of scripture, but it is relevant biblical truth. And it speaks directly to the message of the gospel. Jesus said it like this simply. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now Jesus is speaking about three different things here when he says that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he says I am the way, he's saying I am the road, I am the pathway. I am the way you, any man, any woman, any child will ever get to God. He is the way. And God has been testifying of this way from the foundation of the world. Even when he talked about the judgment that would come to Satan. Talking about how his head would be bruised by the seed of the woman. And how the heel of the Son of God would be crushed as a result of it. We know that the scripture says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible talks about when death is destroyed, then Jesus will put down all of his power and all of his authority and render it back up to the Father. There is a time limit on that prophecy. Sit down on my right hand until thy enemies be made thy footstool. So he will bring all of that which is satanic, all of that which is demonic will be destroyed under the heel of Christ. God has been prophesying this way from the foundation of the world. Even Adam himself is a revelation of Christ. For by him, Adam, the first Adam, all men were made dead. And brought under the captivity of sin. But under the last Adam, all men can be made alive. Hallelujah. And delivered from the captivity of sin. Amen. For by one all died and became subject to sin. But by one, God would deliver all from sin. Oh, and bring them back to the place of life. Lord. Again, God has been testifying of this way from the foundation of the world. Even when you look at the children of Israel in the wilderness and manna is raining down from heaven. And they looked at it and they said, manna, which means what is it or whatness. And it was a prophetic revelation that God's people would not even recognize the bread of God that has come down from heaven among them. And therefore they crucified the Lord of glory. But Moses, one who had a revelation of God, looked at it and said, this is the bread of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Only those that have a relationship with him, only those that talk to the presence of the Lord will recognize who the true bread is. God has been testifying on the foundation of the world. Even when you think about Abraham when he offered his son, on Mount Moriah. And there is a Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. When you fully study it out. And he says, bring your only son. The only son that you love and offer him as an offering unto you. Now we know that Abraham had a son before that. But God said, in Isaac your seed would be called. Yeah. So even though he had another child by Hagar, and he had enough more children with his wife after Sarah died, only in Isaac was his seed called. And so God said, break your only son, who you love and offer him as an offering unto him. A prophetic revelation of Jesus. 
And a very interesting thing that Abraham had mentioned in that whole revelation in that prophecy. It was said, on the third day I and the lad will come to you. Come on. Which was a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus. I and the lad will come to you. It was the third day. It was a prophecy of the resurrection. Of the, of, the, of the resurrection of Jesus. Abraham so believed God that God would give him a seed as the stars of heaven through Isaac in whom his seed would be called. That even if he had to offer him as an offer, he believed he could raise him up to fulfill his word. Hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God has been testifying in this way from the foundation of the world. Jesus is the truth. Hallelujah. Now, interesting, if Jesus is the truth, that means every other presentation is a lie. Yeah. Every other presentation of how you and I get to God is an absolute lie. Because Jesus is the truth. God was so specific in prophecy said that he said, the scepter would not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Hallelujah. And in the book of Revelations you read, when the Lamb of God is found worthy to open the book and to loose the seals, that he's referred to as the Lion of Judah, the root of David. Jesus being the fulfillment of the prophecy Amen. of the lion of the tribe of Judah and Shiloh coming and the people gathering to him. God was so specific to even give us the tribe. He is the truth. Islam is a lie. Amen. Buddhism is a lie. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Every other false religion in the world is a lie. Yeah, yeah. Every other false religion. And even when men can so arrogant and pride to declare themselves as something and to glorify themselves. They are also lies and liars because the Bible talks about false Christ and false prophets. If I stood up here and said I'm the way, I would be lying to you. Did you hear what I just said? If this meeting was all about me, it would be a lie. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm only here to bear witness to the truth. But I'm not the truth. He is the truth. And he is the life. Glory to God. I've heard sometimes people would quote that verse, he's the life, and they didn't really know what exactly God meant by that. Some people take it for prosperity, financial gain, all kinds of ways. I'm the way, the truth, and life. God wants you to have life, so be rich and drive big cars and all that other stuff. That's the life. But if that's your life, it's going to leave you when you die. And it's going to perish with this present world. Because my Bible says that God is going to bring all of this earth to an end. So if that's the life that Jesus came to give you, you're going to lose that. His life. His life. Well, let Jesus define it. The Bible says that Jesus defined the life as this. John chapter 17. He said this, Jesus speaking, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You want to know what life he came to bring us? 
it is to know God and to know Jesus Christ. And that makes sense because when you die, to be absent from the body, if you're a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That continues for an eternity. The Bible talks about those that walk in with a pure heart. Seeing God. Bless them, pure in heart. And they shall see God. Jesus says, I'm the light. Truth of the matter is, is everybody's going to be raised from the dead. What type of resurrection you receive is based on the life you live. The scripture says it like this, the resurrection of life or the resurrection of damnation. So everyone's going to be raised from the dead. And you find that in John chapter 5. So I want to move on from there. And I want to show you a few passages of scripture. Because again, I want to nail this foundation down. And I want to equip some of us, if you are Christians, so that you and I can take these same verses and explain them to the unbeliever. Or if you're someone here who has been one of those people that's a little skeptical about whether or not Jesus is the Son of God, and somebody invited you to this service, well, this is an opportunity for us to solidify this truth to you. So the Bible says this in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. And before that, I'll read John 5 and 39. It says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. Yeah. Now, Jesus was, of course, speaking to those Jews, and he was saying to them, if you believe within the context of these scriptures, you will find eternal life. Guess what? These scriptures are talking about me. <laughs> and so when you go to Romans chapter 3 verse 19 it says this for we know that what thing we know that what some things so ever the law saith is said to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may, be, be, may become guilty before God now when God gave the law of Moses to Moses, one of the things that the law accomplished for us was the knowledge of sin. And under the law, if you were righteous with God, that righteousness would, be, would come by way of works. You would have to achieve the righteousness by works to be right with God. And because none of us have achieved that righteousness. The scripture says if you break one, you're guilty of all. Therefore, all have sinned and come short of God's glory. In another place, the Bible says the law was the ministration of condemnation. You can simply read the law and be condemned. Oh, I didn't do this, or I missed that. In another place it said it's the ministration of death. Condemnation and death by the law. Why did God do it? He wanted to humble us. He wanted all the world to come to a place of saying, I am a wretch. I am not pure in myself.
God in his goodness did not want to leave us there. Because in the law and in the prophets, he said, I want to now show you how to get to me. He bring all of us to the place of humility. Removing all pride. Stopping every mouth, as the scripture says in Romans 3. That every mouth may be stopped and all guilty before God. In his holiness, his righteous standard. And then he goes and says, Now I want to show you how to get back to me. So we read things in the book of Genesis where it says, and he believed in the Lord. And it, it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And we see another clue mentioned in Habakkuk where it says, the just shall live by faith. God started giving us clues on how we get back how do we go from this place of righteousness and filthy rags to purity and holiness, achieving the perfect righteousness of God? In Romans 3, it says it like this. And I'm going to have you turn to a place in a second when I get ready to park. I'm just moving through this kind of quickly because I don't want to keep you all night. But it says this. For we know that the things whatsoever the law says, this is Romans. The law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. All the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But he goes on to say, But now the righteousness of God without the law, it's not achieved by words, is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So we can't achieve this righteousness by the law or doing the works of the law, but the law bears witness to how we get to that righteousness. It bears witness. It's saying, this, this is how you get to it. This is how you get to it. Come on. You can't achieve it by me, the law says, but I'll show you how you can get it. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And then it goes on to conclude, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. Now, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. Now, this is one of the places where you can actually turn your Bibles. Those other one or two line of scriptures, I was moving fast, and I didn't want, I didn't want you to park there. Because by the time you get there, I'll be gone. some of these things. Now we're talking about the witness of the righteousness of God. The witness of the righteousness of God under the law, revealed in the law. Let me say it again, revealed in the law. We cannot right. achieve that righteousness under the law. That's it. But it is revealed in the law. So what we have here, and I want to give you these Quick three points. The Bible has revealed to us the day of Jesus' death. It has revealed to us the year of Jesus' death. And it has also revealed to us the circumstances of Jesus' death. Now all of these things were written concerning Christ hundreds of years before he ever came. Therefore, we know that these men heard from God because they spoke with clarity and detail about who his son is. So that when his son came, we can 
recognize him. You that guy he was talking about in Isaiah. You that guy he was talking about in Exodus. Oh, I see it all happen to you. Just the way the Bible said. You are that guy. In Exodus chapter 12, This is the ordinance of the Feast of the Passover. Now, this was a Jewish festival where they killed a lamb. On the very day they came out of Egypt. And let's read a few of these things. Now, first of all, we have the witness in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul said, Christ is the Passover. So, when I read Exodus chapter 12, with the witness of the Holy Ghost through Paul... I'm looking for Jesus now. I want to see Jesus in Exodus chapter 12. If Christ is the Passover, then when I read the ordinance of the Passover, I should see Jesus. You understand? Yes. See, the only way that you and I are going to be able to convince an unbeliever that Jesus is the Christ is to show them that he fulfilled Bible prophecy. Otherwise, all kind of other men can come and say, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ, I'm the Christ. It's thousands of men declaring they're the Christ. How do you know which one is really the Christ? Right. Well, you have the witness of God. The Bible is God's witness on who is the Christ. And so we have here Exodus chapter 12. One of the things we see here, Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you should take him out of the sheep, out from the sheep, or from the goats. We see that he is a lamb without blemish. Now this being without blemish signifies the fact for us as it relates to Jesus is that he is without sin. How can he die on the cross for our sins if he sinned himself? He will be worthy of death just like the rest of us. God needed a lamb without blemish. That's it. The scripture talks about how Christ, who knew no sin, was made sin for us. Therefore, all of our sins were put on him. That's it. If we come to believe him and accept him. So he's a lamb without blemish. He's a male of the first year. How many of you know that lamb looks pretty young? How many of you know that Jesus, being about 33 years old, looked pretty young down on that cross? He was a young looking man. God said it needed to be a male in the first year. So when God is talking about when that sacrifice needs to be without blemish, this is what I said. When it's a male of the first year, make sure that thing was young. Are you hearing the Holy Ghost? Yes, yes. You hearing God bearing witness of His Son? Amen. 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 An interesting thing about the Scripture is Jesus Himself testified, saying, "Know ye that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified." Which means Jesus died on this very day. He said, "After two days, guess what? It's the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man will be betrayed." So not only did Paul say he was the Passover, but Christ himself testified and said, in two days, guess what? The Son of Man is going to be killed, and it's the feast of the Passover. In a sense, acknowledging that he is that Passover and that it's about his death. And these Israelites in Exodus 12 killed that lamb on that day. That's right. Let's read. And you shall keep it, verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. How many of you read the gospel stories? They rejected Jesus, embraced Barabbas. They were all shouting, what? Crucify him! How did God know that there was going to be a whole crowd of Israelites 
declaring, kill the Passover. Because he said the congregation will, say, will kill it in the evening. He said on the 14th day, the whole assembly. God knew it was going to be an assembly. And he knew that they were going to declare that this Passover be killed. Now we know in Jewish days, when you look at the evening, generally 6 p.m., that's when you have the beginning of the day. Patterned after the book of Genesis, the evening and the morning was the first day. So in a Jewish calendar, the evening really starts at 6 p.m. of the day before. That's the beginning of the day. For Jesus, this Passover would have begun Thursday evening before that Friday at 6 p.m. Now, killing the Passover in the evening... There's a prophecy revealed in that, or the circumstances of the death of Jesus that will be revealed in that. So we know when we see the evening, we see what? Darkness in the sky. The sun is gone down. The Bible said, so that this prophecy could be fulfilled, that God caused darkness. How many of y'all remember that? From the sixth to the ninth hour. How many of you remember that? That's strange. From the sixth to the ninth hour, God caused darkness to cover the earth to fulfill the prophecy that under the circumstances of his death, on the 14th, it would be dark in the sky. It's like a prophetic evening that the Passover will be killed in. So not only do we have the very day, but we have the circumstances of the sky. Think about it. If they kill the Passover in the evening, when you look out, it's going to go down by 60. It's dark. When Jesus died on the cross, God caused it to be dark from six, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. The sixth hour being 12 p.m., counting from 6 a.m. The ninth hour being 3 p.m. That's strange. Yeah. You mean at midday, when the sun is absolute light in its power, you wanted to show us that this was your Passover, so you made the circumstances of the day as if it was evil. That's a testimony. Biblical testimony. Six to the ninth hour, darkness coming. The earth. You find that in Matthew 27, verse 45, where that happened. When you keep reading, verse 7, it says, You shall take the blood and strike it on two side posts. I mean, I see blood on wood. Now. You hear what I'm saying? So I see the circumstances of the sky. I see all of the congregation. He mentioned the assembly killing the Passover. What were they saying? Crucify him. Crucify him. I have the exact date. The 14th of the year. 14th of the month of Eve or Nisan. Sacred calendar, Nissan, silver calendar, same day, same month. I have the date. I have the circumstances. I have the crowd of people. I have what the sky is going to look like. I have blood on wood. I have the assembly killing him. The Bible says that you shall leave nothing of it to remain until the morning. That's Exodus 12 and 10. I 
How many of you know they pulled Jesus off of that cross because they said the Sabbath was coming? I said in Exodus 12, don't leave none of it till the morning. None of it till the morning. And that's why Joseph Arimathea begged the body of Jesus. Pulled him off of the cross because the Sabbath was coming. It's about to be Saturday morning. And he begged the body to pull it down. Because Exodus 12 said none of it should be left until the morning. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you, this is why people die. Because they, they meet Jesus, they walk with him, they see the details of this prophecy showing that nobody fulfilled this but this man. You can even have the year mentioned in Daniel chapter 9. I'm just going to throw this out there for time's sake. The year mentioned in Daniel chapter 9. You have the 483 years from the time the commandment was given to build and to restore Jerusalem. Cyrus destroyed Babylon and freed the Israelites in 539 BC. Cyrus made a declaration that the temple should be rebuilt. 539 BC. But the city was still in shambles when you read the book of Nehemiah. Yeah. And that was under the reign of Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes did not come into power until the scripture says around, well, not the scriptures, but according to study, <laughs> 465 BC. And the Bible says it was in the 20th year of Artaxerxes that Nehemiah got permission from him to go and rebuild the entire city of Jerusalem. He gave him wood and everything. Well, when you end up doing the math of the 483 years, and you time it out based on when they say Artaxerxes was reigning, you end up somewhere around 38. Now, I think that's a window. I know some scholars differ on different opinions. I mean, some say Jesus was born around 5 AD. Others say 1 AD. But at the end of the day, when you do all of that studying, you find out that there's a very small window of years, give or take five years, where Jesus could have come. And the Bible says that the Messiah in Daniel 9 would be cut off in 483 years from the time the commandment had been given to build and restore Jerusalem. So you study from Nehemiah where he got the command to build a city and you just count years. It puts you right around that time of the 33 AD, 38 AD. So you even have the year. Now I'm going to go ahead and end in one more place. I want to show you before we go on and do the prayer for the sick. You even have mentioned in the Psalms the piercing of his hands and feet in Psalms 22. This is the last place I'll take you in. You will want to turn here because if you are a Christian who loves your Bible, this is about to be some of the best stuff you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> You're going to be like, man, I never heard that before. <laughs> You're about to have a good time in the Lord. If you love your word, you want to be able to study the Bible. You ready for this? Exodus 38. Now we've been talking about Jesus being the door. We've been talking about the witness of Jesus. Exodus 38, verse 9. You there? Exodus 38, verse 9. And he said, 
and he made the court. You there? This is the tabernacle of Moses now. And he made the court on the south side. Southward hangings of the court were of fine twine linen and a hundred cubits. Now a cubit is the length of a forearm. So that's how they did their measure. The length of a forearm. So the tabernacle on the south side the scripture was saying is a hundred cubits. Now we know if we were to look at it like this, north, south, east, west, on the south side, a hundred cubits. Now, one of the things that you have to understand about the tabernacle is that it faced the east. God favors the east because the east is also symbolic and a prophetic revelation of the one who makes intercession for us on God's right hand. That's why when the high priest went in to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, he didn't just sprinkle it seven times, but he also sprinkled it eastward. So you find that in the ordinance of the day of atonement. So the door of the tabernacle faced east. On the south side, we have 100 cubits. Let's keep reading. And it said the pillars were 20. So what's 100 divided by 20? And there were brazen sockets, 20. That means they had these 20 pillars and they had brazen sockets. And it said the hooks of the pillars and the fillets, which means where the attachments, were made of silver. So this is what you're supposed to get from that. These pillars had sockets that were made of brass. Wooden pillars, sockets made of brass. But the top part, where the hooks of the pillars were, and the fillets, or the attachments, they were made of silver. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There were 20 of them on the south side where you have 100 cubits. Therefore, you have the pattern or the mention of the number five. So how many of you know when you go down to the next verse, the north side pretty much matches the south side? Okay, so we see at verse 11, the north side having the 100 cubits, and we have the 20, same 20 pillars, and you have the same sockets of brass, that's at the bottom, and then you also have the hooks in, in the pillar, you have the hooks in the pillars, the hooks of the pillars, that's the top part, and you have the little hooks and the fillets that connect the pillars made of silver, so that's the top. Now you have the west side, and it says the west side was 50 cubits. And if it had 50 cubits with 10 pillars, you do the math. 50 divided, 10 divided by, 50 divided by 10 is what? Five. five. Okay, we're still dealing with this number five here. Okay, and so it says that there were 10 pillars on the west side and their sockets. Uh, the sockets were 10 and the hooks of the pillars and their fillets. So you have 10 pillars on the west side. Now, how many of you have ever read the book of Revelations chapter 1? Okay. When I was studying this, I saw a vision of Jesus in Revelations chapter 1. How many of you know that Revelations chapter 1 described his feet as what? Brass, as if it burned in a furnace. But it also said about his hair, on his head was what? White, like wool. The pillars are a revelation of Christ the man. The brass on the feet is a revelation of the glory of God or the ways of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? How many of you know that the, the labor was made of brass? How many of you know that the altar was made of brass? 
I mean, you know that the furniture in the tabernacle is made of gold. There's a difference between the two. Because in this life, you and I will encounter the brazen labor, and we will encounter the altar. But it's not until you enter heavenly Jerusalem that you'll know the fullness of the revelation of the menorah and the table of children. Okay. That's when the revelation is gold, as the furniture is there. How many of you know that they describe the, the gold in, front, in heaven as clear? How many of you ever read that? They said the gold in heaven is clear. Brass is like that same glory, but it's what? Come on. Darker. You hear what I'm saying? We all know that we see through a what? A glass what? Dark. Darkly. So when I saw this pillar... When I looked at this pillar, I saw Christ. I saw, when you look at the, the hooks at the top being the silver, and when John saw him, his hair was that white like wool. You see, it's like an aged man. And then you look at the feet, you have the brass. And then around the tabernacle, you have this whiteness around it. The Bible says what? Fine twine linen is what? Come on. Come on. Clean and white is what? The righteousness of the saints. Then you have the pattern of the revelation, the pattern of five. You have a pattern of five. Where you see 100 cubits on the north, 100 cubits on the south, I have 20 pillars. 100 divided by 25. I see the same thing, same pattern when I look at the west side. It's 50 cubits. 10 pillars. Do the math, five. When you look at the creation, five is the first day you start to see life. When you study biblical numerology, it just kind of looks somewhat at the first seven days. There's Revelation there. So when I look at the tabernacle, I see the, these pillars with these silver tops, these brass feet, and I see white, which represents righteousness. I see the pattern of five all the way around it, which represents light. And I see a figure that appears over and over and over and over and over again, all the way around it. Who is this person represented in these silver tops and these brass feet? In a building where God's presence himself dwells. Brothers and sisters, there is no finding God. There is no getting to the God who dwells in the holiest of holies without going through Christ the man. On the east side, and I'll sum it up with this just by speaking, I know they turn the number of verses, but on the east side, where the actual door is, you have these colors. You have the color of blue, the color of purple, the color of scarlet, and the color of fine twine linen. The blue is a revelation of God's holiness. Ezekiel sees God. He sees his throne. He said his throne was as the appearance of a sapphire stone. When you look up a sapphire stone, it is a strong blue. 
There's another verse of the scripture that talks about how God sits on the throne of his holiness. It's Psalms 47, verse 8. So I see his throne being connected to holiness. And then when Ezekiel see it, I see a color attached to it. Color. I've already told you about the fine twine linen being the righteousness of saints. So we see the fine linen as another fake fragment in the garment. Another piece of that garment. We have the purple. How many of you know that purples represent kings? They put a purple robe on Jesus when they were mocking him and saying, you are the king of the Jews. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Purple is very much connected to royalty. And you do see that in other places within the scriptures. Judges is also, you see purple worn by the kings in the book of Judges. And then lastly, you have the scarlet. And the scarlet is just a revelation of the blood, the sacrifice, the covenant. It's a deep, deep, deep red. In fact, you have, you know, with the whiteness of the Passover, they put the blood on the door. Why did you take that city and Rahab's family was saved? They put a scarlet robe outside of the door, a scarlet thread outside of the door. And the Israelites knew we can't touch this house. In other sense, we'll pass over it in a sense when we get ready to destroy this city because of the scarlet thread outside of the door. It's just a revelation of the blood. It's a revelation of the covenant. So when I see Jesus, I see my righteousness in the white fine twine linen. And this is in the door of the east side now. The east side, the right side, where Jesus is at, in the presence of God. I see the, the white that he's my righteousness. I see the purple, that he is my king. I see the scarlet, that he is my sacrifice. And I see the blue describing his nature as holy. God was telling the world that my son is coming. The door into my presence, the east side of the tabernacle where the door is. You're going to have to pass through these colors. And these colors represent a person. And this person is a king. And he is righteous. And he will be the sacrifice. And he is holy. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lord. Now I just shared this word with you. And if you live this life. And maybe you've not had a chance to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I have given you undisputable evidence where people hundreds of years under the inspiration of God described what his son would look like, what he would accomplish, how he would suffer. God has shown it to you and me in his word. I want to give you an opportunity to confess him and receive him. And right now I just rebuke every spirit of religion. I rebuke every spirit of shame. The scripture says if you don't have the spirit of God, you are none of his. I want to give you an opportunity to receive him today. This is the single greatest miracle that you and I could experience up to today. And that is the miracle of salvation. I want you to come up right now. The scripture says, if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his father in heaven. I need you to come up right now. Come on. Come on. Who else is out there? Who else is out there? Some of you may be sitting in your seat saying, well, I've prayed that prayer before. But guess what? If you're living with somebody that you're not married to, the reality of that prayer does not exist with you. You have a form of godliness, but you've denied the power. 
and you will surely miss heaven. Who else is out there? You do not know if you will make it to your home tonight. And if I were you, I would not take this moment to play with my soul. Salvation. It's time for us to receive it. Come on. It's time for us to live for God for real. God is calling you. God is calling you. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Ghost is dealing with you in your seat, you need to be up here at this altar. I don't care how saved you think you are. If the Holy Ghost is dealing with you, you need to be at this altar. Lord, we just rebuke every spirit of pride. We rebuke every spirit of religion. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. We rebuke every spirit of darkness. We rebuke every unclean spirit. God is calling some of you to rededicate your lives tonight. As the scripture says, if you turn from your righteousness, none of your righteousness will be remembered. That means if you're living in a pattern of willful sin, guess what? God don't remember none of the good you ever did. And he will judge you and accordingly. Come on down. I'm not going to be up here too much longer doing this, but you better come if you say this belongs to you. I will not take a chance for my salvation. For some of you, this could be a rededication. Some of you, I just want to do it to do it just to make sure. I just want to do it because I just need to confess him afresh. If God is dealing with you in your seat, I will come up here right now. Come on now. If you sense it, if you sense that pulling, if you're saying to yourself, I should go up there, that's the Holy Ghost talking to you. That's the Holy Ghost talking to you. Come on. Come on. Come out of those seats. Come out of those seats. Come on out of those seats. God is dealing with you. Come out of those seats. Come out of those seats. Come out of those seats. God is dealing with you. Come out of those seats. If you feel that, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the witness of the Holy Spirit does not lie. If God is dealing with you, you better come out of that seat. You better come out of that seat. It can be trouble for you. You better come out of that seat. The Spirit of the Lord is drawing. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. So you ain't got to be ashamed of Jesus in here. We all on that team. We all on that team. Every single one of us. It's the world that's going to look at you crazy. But we all on that team. Come on. If the, if the Spirit of the Lord is dealing with you, you need to come up. You need to come up right now. Because you're not coming to Pastor Dom. You're coming to the Lord Jesus who's up here. You're coming to the Lord Jesus that's in your sanctuary. Come on. Come on. I'll say it again. If he is dealing with you, whether you think you saved or not, if you hear that voice in your head saying, you need to go up there, you need to come up here. I don't care if you've been baptized. I don't care about any of that stuff. If you sense the Holy Ghost dealing with you, come up here to this altar. Because God wants to break some things off of your life. God, who do you want? He wants to destroy some yokes. And there are some people who say they know God, but they do not know Him. We pray that you draw them up here now, Lord. 
You say in your word, don't let me come to you except the Father draw him. Father, I thank you that you draw him right now to you.
Holiness 